okay so good morning everyone uh, yeah so maybe i need one more session to be able to quickly set up this setting for to work well in any case let's get started so let's go through the question paper first and uh, uh, and then we will continue our discussion so today's lecture will be the last lecture on vectorization and after that we will move on to uh, how to use multiple course parallelization uh, so perhaps we will spend two three classes on parallelization and maybe one or two classes on locality uh, which is a very difficult uh, idea and finally how we put all these things together to get the best performance out of the program so that is the plan for the rest of the course uh, so before that i thought let's uh, review the quiz so that uh, if there are any doubts or no any clarifications that are required we can uh, take them out of our way so first question is a processor runs at 4 gig frequency and another processor is running at 3 gig frequency can you say the first processor has better performance than the second processor how many of you think it says okay, be bold okay only one person huh? so what's the argument for others that why a 4 gig processor shouldn't be better than a 3 gig processor sorry It depends on the number of cores. Yeah. It depends on many other factors. Of course, cores is uh, the big thing. That's what I didn't have in mind. Uh, but of course, cores does have an impact. Uh, or well, no, we, we cannot just say cores also it depends on the size of the cores and other things. But broadly speaking, microarchitecture plays a role because when you design the The frequency at which a processor run depends on various critical paths that are there in the processor hardware architecture. Like for example, if you have a multiplier circuit, which takes 20 nanoseconds uh, to compute, then the clock pulse width should be at least 20 nanoseconds to be able to accommodate that multiplication operation. Well, uh, what can you do? So what you can do is uh, you can pipeline the multi multiplier architecture, multiplier circuit, or even if you don't pipeline the multiplier circuit, you know, you just divide it into multiple stages and uh, run it in uh, 10 stages. And uh, so because of it, the critical path length will go down and you might be able to run your processor at a higher frequency but that doesn't mean no your processor is running fast because in order to be a multiplayer operation you still require 10 clock seconds okay instead of one clock cycle you require 10 clock seconds so this whole you know and then there are all these super scalar processes a whole lot of things that come into play uh, beyond uh, the processor frequency what we can say is if the micro architecture remains the same okay, and uh, we just reduce the transistor size and because of the reduction in the transistor size we are able to switch on and off the transistor at a much higher speed and because of that the gate delays have reduced and because of that the critical path length has decreased and because of that we are able to run the processor at a higher speed then in that case we can say that a 4 gig speed processor is better than a corresponding 3 gig speed processor but otherwise you cannot make that so you have to be careful when you look at these things like for example you will see uh, that there is a special purpose accelerator which runs at 300 meg megahertz and then there is a general purpose processor which runs at 3 gig uh, speed 
but the special purpose processor could be performing way better than the general purpose processor, although it is running at a uh, you know, few megahertz. Uh, the reason being uh, the number of computations that you are able to do in parallel, uh, the micro architecture of that uh, special purpose accelerator could be quite different from the general purpose processor because of that it is getting way better performance. So please keep this in mind. It's a very, very important idea. So that's the reason I want uh, I pose this question so that you can reflect upon this, uh, uh, no, this particular point again. Second is what is the maximum achievable program speed up if at most 75% of the program is parallelizable? So what is it? Four times speed up or four times three fourths. No? So how do we do? Help me out here. So serial execution time by parallel execution time. If you take serial execution time as one unit, and uh, so if you take the parallel plus serial part, so what we have is a parallel part is uh, one fourth, huh? three fourth, right? But most seventy five percent of the program is parallelizable. So you have, uh, no, this is three by four plus one by four, and if uh, yeah. So if you take the whole parallel part, if you can uh, execute uh, no, using as many processors as you would like, then this factor goes to zero and you will get four x squared. You all got it, right? This is AMD also. So you, you don't get four x speed up actually because there are lots of challenges in parallelization overheads in parallelization, but uh, theoretically, this is the best that you can get. 4x is the theoretical best speed up that you can get. Uh, the second follow-up question is based on Gustav Sansla. Uh, given application where you may want to invest in more compute resources in spite of the speed up bonds given by Android. So, so what application you have? Sorry, machine. What what part of machine learning? Like data. So, like for example, let's say if you are uh, trying to train a uh, Telugu to English language translator machine learning model, earlier you could be training the machine learning model using one terabyte of data. Uh, but uh, if you have more compute resources available, you might be able to use ten terabytes of data. Okay, so that way the model accuracy could improve. Or in gaming, you know, like for example, uh, so let's say if you are playing FIFA, you know, uh, then what happens uh, then, uh, if you have more compute power available, then perhaps you can add more agents to the game, you know, like for example, uh, some random audience running onto the field. Okay. So there are, your game is a collection of agents and uh, uh, interacting with each other. You can uh, add more agents to your game and bring more realistic effect uh, to, the, to the game. All right. Uh, or usually, you know, like other way of thinking is uh, in, uh, again, same referring to FIFA, uh, usually what, can happen is I'm I'm just guessing uh, a strategy. Uh, whichever the agent or the player has the ball, the corresponding thread could be given more compute power, and uh, and the threads corresponding to other players may not be given enough compute power because they are uh, slightly less important. Uh, but that may affect the overall game experience. Uh, for you know, for pros, we may not be able to observe it. Uh, but if you have more compute power available, then the players uh, uh, who doesn't have the ball also, they could be given more threads, more compute power, so that we can get a more realistic uh, game experience. And what is the, going on to question third, what is the difference between SIMD and uh, uh, SPMD? Uh, 
yeah simd is instruction uh, single instruction multiple data stream that is our vector processors vector instruction sets and uh, single program uh, multi data stream uh, yeah. same program is run on multiple different compute systems also uh, usually this falls under distributed computing paradigm and in fact in machine learning also uh, in distributed machine learning what happens is let's say your 10 terabytes of data uh, is split into 10 shards or 10 chunks each of size 1 terabyte and the 10 different machines or they independently learn from this 1 terabyte of data so each of these 10 machines they have in uh, uh, machine learning model but it's not exactly the same what happens is these models they exchange with each other and they merge the model okay and then again they go back and read and then again they come and merge them so this is distributed machine learning approach so that is the same uh, this so in this example the same uh, learning algorithm is run on all 10 different machines but on different so Great. Uh, in Flint's taxonomy, what architectural approach doesn't have a representative real world system? Multiple, multiple instruction, single data stream. Uh, there are no natural or intuitive uh, machines uh, which follow that pattern. How do you estimate the raw compute power theoretically? Number of sockets. Okay, on your motherboard, you can have usually, like for example, on this particular system, it may have only one socket, or all on all your laptops, they may have only one socket. But if you go to server class machines, it is uh, common to have two sockets or four socket, or even eight eight socket. I'm not sure, uh, but it could it is possible. Uh, so four socket systems, and every socket will have multiple cores. And uh, so number of sockets into number of cores into uh, you know, the number of uh, cycles per second that is uh, determined, which is determined based on the frequency at which the processor is running into the number of floating point operations per cycle. And the number of floating point operations per cycle, it depends on quite a number of things. And that's what we will see again last class we looked at the loop, roof line analysis picture but it is not uh, quite uh, we have to look at it again uh, to get a kind of little bit better understanding of the roof line analysis picture uh, give one pitfall in using theoretical flops to decide which compute system to procure say for your research project so sorry so that is there yeah so you may not your workload may not be floating point uh, operations okay? so it could be based on strings and integer ops so you have to watch out for it just because a system has you uh, know huge flops doesn't mean you should automatically buy that system you have to do what is your workload and uh, whether you are uh, the system that you are considering uh, no uh, does well on the workload that you are considering. You are looking at. So now let's look at this uh, last problem that is uh, uh, BLAST level two matrix vector operation. And uh, yeah, so let's go back. So 30 gigabytes is the main memory, gigabytes per second is the main memory bandwidth, 150 gigaflops. What is the reach point? So now let me share. Okay. So the problem that we have is uh, why why is equal to uh, alpha a x plus uh, beta y. Right. This is the problem now. And we assume that uh, A is an N by N matrix. And uh, no, so X and uh, Y, they are uh, N by one vectors. 
alpha and beta are scalars. Alpha, beta or scalars. So now here, let's try to do the analysis for this one. Uh, so in order to do uh, A, if you do AX, no, let's look at uh, uh, the matrix vector uh, computation. Uh, there are N rows and every row has uh, each row. If you look at each row, uh, this is what happens, right? You take this one. And you take this vector and uh, multiply it with this. And that has uh, n multiplications, n multiplications, plus uh, n minus one additions. So we have overall uh, two n minus one operations for in order to generate in order to generate one element of the product uh, no product is very x here we have 2 n minus 1 and there we have n rows so we have 2 n minus 1 into n and then we have to multiply alpha also right so that will add to uh, that will add n multiplications yes or no? and then if you look at beta y so beta y requires uh, uh, n multiplications and then in order to add this with this we have uh, n more operations are you all with me here okay so this is uh, ax and after uh, this we get the alpha ax and then uh, so this corresponds to beta y and then uh, we need this uh, when we want to uh, put these things together so they contribute to this uh, so overall number of computations is uh, how much 2n square 2n square minus n plus n plus 2n so that is 2n square plus 2 is this right 2n square plus 2n is the total number of computations and uh, what is the amount of data that we have to bring in from the memory? We are computing the operational intensity, right? So n square is the matrix size and uh, X and Y is what we have to bring n square plus two. Uh, well, if you do limit analysis, so what do we get the limit as n tends to infinity? Sorry? Ah, okay, okay. So this is yeah, good point. So what got four in the denominator we get right n square. So now if you take limit, what do we get? We get uh, zero point five, right? Because this n square dominates, so limit as n tends to infinity. This is two by four. This is zero point. This is the operation. Does this make sense? Okay. If 0 0.5 is the operational intensity, if 0 0.5 is the operational intensity of this program, OI is 0 0.5, and memory bandwidth is uh, how much? 30 gigabytes per second, then, uh, uh, then achievable compute power, achievable, achievable flops is memory bandwidth into operational intensity, 30 into half, which is 15 gigaflops. And what is the available compute power? 150 gigabytes, uh, gigaflops, right? Available compute power is 150 gigaflops. So there is a lot of compute power still available, but we are not able to feed data at a rate 
uh, to use the all the available compute power. Uh, so what it means is, uh, is this a memory bound program or compute bound program? When we say something is memory bound, the limitation is, is coming from the memory bandwidth, not because of the available compute power. So this is clearly a memory bound because if you can increase that 30 gigabytes per second to let's say to 100 gigabytes per second, okay, then the compute power goes to 50 gigaflops per second. So when the operational intensity is very low, we are really challenged because we have to work hard to be able to use available compute power completely. Okay, so this because the operational intensity is so. What is the now? What is the rich point here? Rich point is the place where a program turns over from memory bound to compute bound. So that means if you take memory bandwidth into some operational intensity is equal to peak gigaflops per second. So now peak gigaflops is 150 gigaflops per second and the available memory bandwidth is uh, 30 into operational intensity. So operational intensity at the rich point is, you know, remember in this picture, it goes like this and it goes like this. This is operational intensity. So the place where this happens is when the operational intensity is equal to five, then the transition happens. This is the place. So in order for us to be able to make this program, this Jumbi program, which is a blast level one program or level two program into compute bound, we have to boost up its operational intensity from 0.5 to 5. Because we may not be able to do much with uh, the memory bandwidth because it is a physical property of the system. So we have to boost up the operational intensity of this program from 0 0.5 to 5. It may or may not be possible. It may or may not be possible. Uh, so in this particular example, do you think it is possible to boost up its operational intensity somehow? Look at the problem. Let's go back and look at. Uh, Is the one. Yeah, if you stare at this problem, do you think there is any hope for improving the operational intensity of this program? Yes, yes, very good. So here we are using at least one place where uh, uh, we can improve the operational intensity is uh, we are using the vector x again and again. If somehow we can uh, you know, keep vector x uh, in the memory, okay, uh, or uh, put parts of uh, vector x, uh, you know, then uh, uh, then the number of times that we have to go to the main memory goes down, and that effectively the the, the, the denominator in the top in the computation of operational intensity goes down, and that can boost up our overall operation. Are you all with me here? So the, the reason why you know, we are spending a lot of time here is uh, when we are trying to op go for improving the performance of programs, we should uh, go about this thing systematically. Not all problems are very easy to analyze, but at least we need to have an approximate model which guides our efforts, like where should we put our effort in uh, no in optimizing the performance of particular this particular this thing always should be in the back of the mind just don't blindly do things and also it's very important down the lane when you want to buy machines you know uh, this this machine is not giving me performance okay you spend you no know, couple of more lakhs and buy a new machine and you know you fight with your boss get two more lakhs and then it gives the same performance okay you are in trouble. So when you are investing money, you should really see you know, whether the money that you invest in procuring these hardware resources, whether they will have any kind of impact on the performance that you're hoping for, the performance you are looking for. 
Great. So now, uh, where are we? So this is the roof line uh, picture. It is not disconnected. Not this. So this is the picture that we have seen in the last class. I want to revisit this picture. And uh, again, uh, no, I didn't fix uh, or I didn't try to figure out, you know, how to improve this fonts. Uh, yeah, I did actually. So there is a setting which says shows the original size, but the original size is also not there. Okay. So anyways, so let's, uh, yeah, what I would like you to pay attention here is, uh, I would like you to observe, uh, observe the different compute roof lines that you are seeing here. The first compute roof line that you are seeing here is this, which says that if you use scalar uh, floating point operations, then you get the eight point, the peak compute power that you can get on this machine is 8.55 gigaflops. So this is the first observation. Scalar add peak. If you are addition operations, if you, uh, we can perform 8.55 gigaflops uh, uh, addition operations. This is the peak. And uh, so here, if you see, uh, the x-axis here is the operational intensity. The x-axis here is the operational intensity. And the memory bandwidth, if the DRAM memory bandwidth is 23.41, this is what you're seeing here. The DRAM memory bandwidth is. So if your operational intensity falls anywhere, if the operational intensity of a program so here the peak compute power that is achievable is uh, operational intensity. So how do you get this line? This line is obtained by multiplying memory bandwidth into operational intensity. This is how we get this line, okay? And as the operational intensity increases, the peak flops keeps increasing uh, until you hit this point where you, know, you cannot, uh, even if the memory bandwidth increases, you will not be able to do any more computations because this is the best that you can do. The scalar add operations, this is the best that we can do. And this is a ridge point. This is the ridge point. And it so turns out for this particular bandwidth and for the scalar add operations, uh, so the operational intensity, the ridge point is something like 0 0.25. Yesterday when I calculated, it turned out to be 0 0.25. And our program, the particular program, SACSP program that you are looking for, it's, uh, it also has a uh, operational intensity, which is very close to 0 0.25. So because of that, you can see, you know, this point and this point are very close to each other. Well, it's not exactly here because, you know, uh, there could be other uh, issues because of which we may not be able to fit all the way here, depending upon the load on the system and other things like that. Uh, but this is all, uh, but if somehow, if they, if we can uh, cache that, uh, no, whatever the data that we have, and if we can get the data, if we can somehow cache the data and store it in uh, L3, uh, on, in the L3 cache, the bandwidth of the L3 cache is 66 uh, uh, gigabytes per second. So if you are able to supply data at such high rate, then you can see, then we will, the ridge point will shift to the left. When the bandwidth doubles from 23 to 66, no, it is more than doubling. Then what happens is the ridge point will shift to the left. Okay, that means you soon hit the memory, you know, the compute bound. You soon hit the compute bound. And if you are able to further improve the, uh, now, if you are able to cache the data in L2 cache, and the L2 cache memory bandwidth is 117 GB per second, then the reach point will shift further here. And if it is in L1 cache, it is 356 GB per second. So if you are if you are able to hold the data in uh, no, L1 cache, then what happens is if you go down and see, 
the operational intensity required in the program is so, so low. L1 cache access time is very, very close to the register file access time on the processor. So because of that, the data speed, you know, the, to the processor will be extremely high, like in one or two clock cycles, you will be able to supply data to the processor. And because of that, you will be able to saturate the processor even at a very low uh, operational intensity. So that's our goal. So the in the second or third part of this uh, course, after we look at parallelization, once we start looking at locality, our goal is how we can promote the data from you know, DRAM uh, from DRAM to L3 cache to L2 cache to L1 cache. And if you are able to successfully do it, the effective memory bandwidth increases. And even with less operational intensity, even with even with less operational intensity, we will be able to, to hit the compute loop. Are you with me here? This is the first observation that you can see a huge difference in the main memory bandwidth of DRAM, L3, L2, L1, and registers, of course, is extremely fast, but registers, uh, uh, they cannot hold enough amount of data and there are other kinds of challenges, so we don't uh, focus on that. What happened? Disconnect account again. Now, the second important thing that I would like to see here, the observe here is, uh, this is the ad, uh, the line that you're seeing here now, this is the scalar ad. And if you go above here, the one that got highlighted, that is, if you read carefully, it is double precision vector ad. So if you are working with double precision vector uh, instructions, then the peak achievable flops are 33.85 gigahertz. So, so then what happens here is, you uh, know, let's say, for example, uh, initially you could be memory bound, initially you could be memory bound, uh, but because of the increase in the bandwidth, uh, what happens is you become compute bound. Okay, let's say, uh, yeah, let's say if you are, if, you, if your operational intensity, we will keep revisiting this here, if your operational intensity some, lies somewhere here, then what happens is this is your, let me clear the screen. If your operational intensity of a particular program is somewhere here. And now if you go see, uh, then this is the, it's a memory bound program. Now what you did is you transformed the program so that uh, it can use, uh, uh, what do I say, uh, the L3 cache well. And if it can use the L3 cache well, then technically speaking, the achievable compute power should jump from here to here, but it cannot jump from here to here because you are using only scalar add instructions. So you get, uh, no, so you get, uh, this, this becomes a roof line. Are you with me here? We change the program so that somehow we are able to cache the data into the L3 cache. Because of that, we can potentially achieve, you know, like something like 11 gigaflops or something like that. But what happens is uh, if you are just using scalar add instructions, you cannot achieve 11 gigaflops. So from memory bound, it becomes compute bound. So what should be the next focus then after that? What should we do? You should go for vectorization. So now when we go for a vectorization, what happens is, you know, the roof lane goes above and from 10, 9 gigaflops, you will be able to do 39 gigaflops. The roof line goes above. Now, what happens once you use vectorization? The program becomes memory bound or compute bound? The program becomes memory bound because, you know, if you are using, uh, you have to improve in order to hit this the compute intensity, you have to improve your operational intensity from, you uh, know, from whatever this number to something else to be able to use. So this is how you should keep uh, looking at it. So right now, whether I'm compute bound or memory bound, if I am memory bound, then you know, increase operational intensity uh, by using the cache as well. And once, and then you will see that you are able to use the peak compute power. And then after that, what should you do? So now you see that the compute is the bound. 
and then now instead of using scalar instructions you go to vector instructions and then again see what is happening you you may now realize that it is now memory bound and then you have to improve again your cache line performance so that you can make it compute bound once it becomes compute bound now what you do from vectorization you want to use multi core systems do you see what is happening here so we this is the this is called as uh, uh, what is the uh, bound analysis i forgot the right term so we have to keep at every point when you are trying to optimize your program always keep an eye on the bound is it compute bound or memory bound if it is memory bound work on it if it is compute bound so if it is memory bound what should where should you focus on improving locality if it is compute bound what should you do you should go for vectorization you should go for parallelization that's all very very simple that is a mantra of uh, working on multi core systems this principle in general is true for uh, uh, any arbitrary system okay, like for example right now we are only considering the hierarchy of uh, memory and uh, processor but if you go to machine learning for example where data is all present in the hard disk then we have to look at whether the whole thing is io bound because io bound is much more tricky problem to solve okay because in order to right now we are working in microseconds uh, uh, space when you go to io it becomes milliseconds space okay so now you have to see you do all the optimizations you want to do on your kernel but you are waiting no forever waiting for uh, uh data on the disk then uh, it doesn't matter you are optimizing the wrong place okay so then you have to see how you can optimize the io accesses okay great awesome uh so i want to do one more uh, yeah let's keep going here uh again if you see uh, after uh, you can see dp vector the next line that you see is dp vector fma remember uh, if you are able to use fma instructions fuse it multiply and add instructions then the performance you no know, just uh, boosts uh, almost doubles because the uh, your arithmetic and logic unit is optimized to perform multiply and addition operations within a single process but your ability to double to develop your compute power depends on the programmers and the compilers ability to use fma instructions and fma is quite common thing if you see right now you know when you take a matrix and you multiply with a vector you are taking a dot product of every row of matrix with the column vector that is there so that's all fma operations and all image processing all machine learning everywhere you see fma operations because at the end of the day you will be doing matrix vector multiplications or matrix to matrix multiplications or vector vector multiplications in all these cases fma is the common so but you if you go and check that if you disassemble the code and see you may not have used the compiler may not have been able to use the fma instruction because uh, it has trouble eliciting some uh, properties of the program which permits it to use fma instructions so then there you have to work towards it to see how i can help the compiler so that it can generate uh, fm instructions okay and finally if you go all the way up here sp vector fma peak is 136 uh, gigaflops one thing that is not clear to me is uh, whether this flops computation by the intel tool <laughs> whether it includes all the four cores or whether it's a single core it's not clear to me so this is sorry there is that's true there is an option for multi threaded thing so that's the reason why i am thinking no it's not doing multi threaded analysis it is doing a single thread analysis where is it here compare oh one core oh awesome thank you ha huh, 791 gigaflops huh? if we use uh, six cores nice performance 990 fm a big 790 okay very happy 
So up to 800 gigaflops of computation I can do on my system, but I don't think I never used more than one gigaflop or two gigaflops of computation. Perhaps maybe uh, it could be possible when we are doing a Zoom session, uh, the video for this video processing, it could be doing some floating point operations. But uh, yeah, nice. So now our thing is looks ridiculous. No, we are per getting a performance of four gigaflops, and the machine can do eight hundred gigaflops, and it's looking depressing. Okay, great, awesome. So now let's look at one more very interesting problem. Uh, uh, which is quite common in uh, both machine in image processing and machine learning. And we will try to do a uh, uh, this operational intensity analysis for that problem. Let's see. Yeah, okay, got it. So I just randomly picked out uh, a slide from some other tech. Uh, so in image processing, so it is quite common. Uh, no, many of the image processing uh, uh, applications uh, involve applying a filter on uh, an image. So here we have a 2D image. You can ignore all this line buffer and all this stuff. So we have an image and you can see a three cross three filter uh that is a small matrix which contains some values in it and what we do is we take this filter and keep moving this filter uh, across uh, the whole of this image and we generate uh, uh, another image here like for example here if you see uh, when we keep this one here uh, this uh, you we take uh, we take the values in this red matrix, red filter matrix, with the corresponding window from the original image, and we compute a dot product. And the dot product uh, is stored in this pixel. Like for example, this could be to, if in order to blur an image, you can perform this operation. Okay, you can kind of do some kind of averaging operation. If you take the original image, and if you take the blurred image, and if you take the difference between them, you can get the edge image, for example. Okay. Uh, now here, similarly, when this red filter matrix is placed on this grid, so we take the corresponding uh, values, uh, we multiply the corresponding pixel values and add them up and uh, it generates uh, this particular pixel. So this is what is called a stencil operation. Okay, this small three cross three window, it is called as a stencil. We are moving the stencil across the original image, and as we move this uh, stencil across the original image, we generate a new image out of it. And in image processing, in like when you are doing on your phones, you know, on iPhone or any phone, uh, or you know, this Adobe Photoshop, all it does is this operation. There is an original image. When you apply different transformations, corresponds to applying different kinds of filters. Usually what we do is we apply a series of filters and finally to in order to get a uh, interesting effect uh, on the final image, uh, no, you do different kinds of uh, apply different filters in different orders. So now, uh, if you want to write code to perform this operation, uh, how many loops will be there? What will be the loop structure of the code?
how many looks well just before the class i tried to write code for this by myself it is giving segmentation point okay, so <laughs> So first, before I improve the performance, I need to fix the segmentation part. Okay, so anyways, uh, so the simple idea is uh, this, no, like, uh, so you have this original image and uh, no, so you take this, uh, so you place this here and then you move it here and then you move it here and then you move it here, so on and so forth. Uh, so the outer for i is equal to uh, whatever. So this goes uh, like this. This is the i is the height. No, i goes. Uh, this is the i dimension, and this is the j dimension. Uh, sorry. Yes. So this is j. This is the width. So what happens is. Uh, yeah, what did I do? Yeah. So you go through, you scan the row first. Scanning the row corresponds to the inner loop uh, J. We go across width. And uh, after we scan the first row, we go to the next row. So scanning the height corresponds to the outer loop. Scan height. And here this is scan width. And here the innermost loop, so this is the convolution operation. This is the place where we actually perform, multiply the filter coefficients with the actual image. So this is the convolution operation. Are you all with me here roughly? You don't need to understand the code. Uh, naturally speaking, when we are trying to move this, you know, like uh, uh, we have to, at the boundaries, we get into trouble. Uh, so because of that, so there are two ways of handling boundaries, uh, because you cannot uh, take a, this filter window out like this. So since we cannot take the filter window out like this, the generated output image, its dimensions will be slightly less than the original images dimensions. And if you want the output image dimensions to match the original image dimensions, then we paired up with zeros here the boundaries of the original image we pad up there are again there are different padding strategies in uh, image processing but we pad up if you want the output image dimensions to be exactly the same as the input image pad the out, the input image with appropriately uh, either zeros or the last column or the first column wherever you are doing that uh, padding and uh, otherwise you get the output image dimensions will be slightly lesser than the original image dimensions. Can you take few minutes and try to do the operational intensity analysis on this program? Can you take pen and paper and try to compute the operational intensity analysis? It will be a nice exercise for you. I'll wait for a few minutes. In order to produce one output pixel, let's do one thing. Let's do it together. So what we are looking at, operational intensity analysis, operational intensity analysis. Okay. Uh, so, how many output uh, in order? How many output pixels are there? If you just uh, approximately n square, right? It could be, you know, it might be slightly less because of the padding thing, but uh, 
we can just assume that the output pixel, the, the dimensions of the output image are uh, n square pixels, n square output pixels. I'm just doing an approximation. We may miss out on small factors, but it's okay. Uh, otherwise, what happens is the dimensions of the output pixel, if you want to compute exactly, it will be something like n minus k by two into n minus k by two where k by k is the stencil size, k by k is the stencil. Okay, something like that will be. But anyway, so we do an approximation and square output pixels. And in order to compute uh, each of these, uh, for each output pixel, how many computations we have to do? K square multiplications and k square minus one additions. Yes or no? So that is, can I say k square into two k square? Right, because so remember, this is our k by k matrix. So when you convolve it with a, a section of the input image, every pixel, every coefficient corresponds, generates a multiplication. So k square values will be generated. And we, when we add them up, we require k square minus one additions. So it is overall two k square minus one. So we are ignoring that minus one. So two square, this is n square into two, two k square operations. And what's the denominator? How much data we have to bring? In order to compute one output pixel, If you look at the loop, okay. So if you look at the loop, what happens? Uh, we are uh, 